I'm Diane, just if you're keeping track, we got kind of mixed around there, so welcome, <laughs> thank you for coming, we appreciate it. I'm also very conflicted about something else this morning. Well, not conflicted about my name, I did remember that, but <laughs> I was very conflicted about what to wear. I had this nice new track suit hanging there today. I had hung out two suits last night, the business suit and the track suit, and I started pulling the track suit on this morning because I thought, I'm talking about physical activity, darn it, but my uh, common sense, I guess, got the better of me, so I went back to the business suit. But I wish I'd worn the track suit. I wanted you to know that. Um, secondly, the reason I wanted to wear a track suit is not only the topic, but it's reflective of my background. Even though I'm a professor now and have been at the university for about 20 years, I really, my heart and my roots and my joy in life is really out in the field, working in physical activity contexts with kids. I've done that my whole life. And I'm just mentioning a few things just to connect with some of you in the audience. I've worked uh, not only my training in, in uh, undergraduate school was as a K-12 through physical education teacher and coach and health educator. I've also worked at a lot of recreation. I've always been conflicted, I guess, as I think about it. I loved parks and recreation and worked in youth programs. Um, I worked in faith-based, many different faith-based sorts of ministry, outdoor adventure types of programs through churches and things like that, and just really um, enjoy every aspect of working with youth, and particularly enjoy, obviously, the physical activity aspects. So, so I'm, I'm still conflicted, but I'm loving every minute of it. Um, the other thing I'd like to do in terms of setting the scene today, my big job is to set the scene for what Nicole and Mo are going to be talking about in terms of some specific examples. So if you'll bear with me during my talk, I'm going to give you the big picture of what um, physical activity in youth development contexts involves. And I think about two things. One, there are programs that are physical activity based and certainly then present very uh, formative contexts for youth development. But another thing I'd ask you to think about, because many of you are not in those programs that are specifically devoted to physical activity, so I'd ask you and charge you, I guess, and encourage you to think about how you can build physical activity breaks or physical activity opportunities into other types of programs that you're already doing, even if that isn't the primary focus of your program. And one thing, another thing that I uh, struggle with, I guess, when I'm thinking about all the different areas that we represent is language. There are so many different ways, I think, and so many different terms and semantics of what we're talking about that I sort of jump between them today, I guess, to give you the point that I've Kind of finally come to after several years of looking at this topic, and that is to say, you know, sports psychology, which is my background, and as is Nicole's and Moe's, uh, we talk a lot about building competencies, and, and yet when I start reading the youth development literature, terms like assets come up, and life skills, and all of these terms to me are reflective of the same kinds of things. We're all in the same boat working toward the same ends, we just might use different terms. So we've been talking with a group lately about prevention science, so I I also, also think of the words prevention and promotion. So I think in terms of what all of us are talking about today, there are certainly prevention aspects to wanting kids to be physically active, and there are certainly promotion aspects to wanting kids to be physically active. So both of those come into play today. Um, I have about three major things that I'll try to get through in terms of setting the groundwork for you. The first is to just give you some physical activity basics. Some of you, this is review, some of you are very active, know this stuff, and maybe you can help your colleagues today get a handle on this. But for those of you that don't know some of the basics of physical activity, here's essentially my working definition. When, when I talk about physical activity participation for children and youth, I'm thinking about engagement, learning, and performance in a wide variety of activities involving a substantial physical effort component. That's my broad-based definition of what I mean by physical activity participation. And again, I think it's a definition that will work for my colleagues as well. Secondly, another thing that I think about in terms of uh, identifying what we want for young people, my target for young people in physical activity would be an optimal healthful balance in frequency, intensity, duration, and type, which I'll talk more about in just a few moments. But basically, the idea is that Identify for yourself what that optimum amount is in the programs that you work in. And then secondly, con consider that there's a continuum or range of behavior, so they can be in some sort of optimum range. That'll be a little bit different for different people. But have them target something. Give them a target. And the second thing is that certainly, particularly when we look at the sport 
the high-level elite type sports situations, there are dangers associated with e either end of that continuum. Underactive is a problem, but so is overactive if it has negative health consequences. So again, think of what our ideal target and optimum target is for young people. And, and Mo will, um, I, Nicole will be talking a little bit more about this, but let me just plant in your mind that sometimes people think we're sport people. And we are sport people, but we're physical activity people broadly defined. So all of us are interested in youth sport, meaning that more organized competitive sport situation. But all of us also are broad-based physical activity people. And so when we're talking about physical activity today, we're talking about this wide variety of contexts, both in school and out of school time, organized, structured, relatively unstructured, free, sort of free play opportunities. So we're talking about that broad spectrum today, just to make it clear that we're not just talking about organized competitive sport. We want all of this for our young people. Another part of our basic training, as I think about it, in terms of physical activity, is that physical fitness, most of us, I think, think of the health-related aspects of physical fitness when someone says that term. And certainly the health-related aspects are terribly important and one of the key components of physical activity for young people. But there are also other components that I would argue to you in the brief time that we have today that you should also consider as terribly important to positive youth development. And I'll show you what that means in a minute. So we're thinking about fitness as a set of attributes that kids have or achieve that relates to their ability to perform physical activity. But those attributes or those components include not only the very important health-related fitness that I think, again, most of us think about when we hear the word fitness, cardiorespiratory fitness, body composition, um, muscular strength and endurance, and so on, but there are also skill-related components that underlie not only sport skills, but many of our basic movement activities in life that, again, I would argue provide a strong physical foundation for all, many other things that youth engage in. And there also, I would argue, in terms of setting the scene today, that there's, there are all these activity-related, that's my term because no one really gives that a term, but in my mind, I think about these activity-related pieces. And, and you know, um, so Mo is going to talk about a golf program, and golf certainly is a powerful context, as you'll hear from her work, for developing many of what, most of what you already think of as life skills. I would also argue that golf itself is important as an activity, for example, that when a young person grows up and is good at a particular few activities, everyone will have different ones, but that those abilities to play golf, let's say, I would argue are transferable, for example, and will help them in other contexts, such as business contexts or social contexts and so on. So I'm always careful to say the physical attributes or the physical fitness gains are life skills also. So think broadly in terms of components. Now also, I think most of you have a sense of this, but as you start refining your thinking and, and trying to put this into practice with your young people, think about, I use the FIT term, F-I-T is pretty common, I always add the extra T, and I think about in terms of the physical activity that we target for youth, that we'd like youth ideally to have, we want frequency, preferably five or more days a week, but something is better than nothing, which I think is a really important point for people, kids and youth that are just starting out, that are underactive and you're trying to ease them back in. Something is better than nothing. So frequency, preferably daily, five or more days a week, great. I'll take three or more. I'll take whatever you, you can get them to do as a start because I know that once they get hooked on it, they're going to want to do more. Intensity, moderate to vigorous activity, physical activity is a term, MVPA, that you will see if you read in the physical activity literature. That basically what that means is at least some increase in breathing or heart rate is what, again, our physiologists would tell us we need for the physiologic metabolic gains. And I added the word optimally challenge, so an optimally challenging, so an intensity that is optimally challenging. A time, again, total of 30 to 60 minutes a day would be our target. But what I think is really great, which I've felt for years, and I'm glad they finally stamped their approval on this, is that you can accumulate that over the course of a day. I would have to do this myself. You, I expect many of you do, too. I don't have an hour, rarely, at one time to devote, but I'll squeeze 10 or 15 minutes in at different times during the day, and it accumulates. So aim for that. 
And then the type, again, different types, anaerobic, aerobic, strength, endurance, flexibility, and so on. So, so think about the different components as well. Well, what are some examples of how physically active children and youth are today? I know you've all seen many statistics, so I just picked, up, picked out a few examples for you from the National Risk, Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey. Uh, in 2005, the data tells us that overall, among 9th through 12th graders, 36% of that age group is active on at least five of the last seven days at that minimum standard that we talked about. However, notice a gender difference. Among girls, that's about 28%. Among boys, more like 44%. So there's a great gender disparity there in terms of physical activity. So those are national statistics. In terms of Minnesota, I, you can see in the first column on the left is United States statistics. This is a different data source, and notice the definition's a little bit different, so you can't compare these directly. They're talking about uh, children and youth who are active for at least 20 minutes a day, three or more days in the last week, which is, again, very minimal, but it's something's better than nothing. But look, uh, Minnesota actually, compared to the United States average, is better than average on most of the markers. I think all of the markers, actually. And so, again, as a state, if we take this down to the state level, we're doing well, but we could do better. And again, you notice, though, that boys are more active than girls. And another, age trend, another trend you start seeing here is an age trend that, again, in every data set I've looked at, kids become less active as they move through those adolescent years. And you see that reflected in this data, both in the national sample and in the Minnesota sample. And then in terms of Hennepin County, uh, there was some data that came out this fall from a survey. Again, a little bit different definition and a little bit different age groups, but it gives you an idea. So if you look on the right-hand side, right under the orange bar where it says physically active, 58% of 6 to 17-year-olds in Hennepin County were active for at least 60 minutes, five or more days a week uh, during the uh, period of the survey. 71% of adolescents, a little bit different age group, 7th through 12th graders were involved in sport activities in a typical school week. So again, fairly high participation. However, one thing you also notice when you start looking at the data is there are certain populations, you're getting a feel for this already with what I've shown you, certain populations that are underserved in physical activity. And these are some examples. This is my definition of underserved. I think of underserved as any child who's, or youth who's not meeting these minimum target optimal sort of standards that we're talking about. That's just my working definition, because in my mind, I think we need to serve them better. We need to do something to get them engaged, to motivate them, to give them opportunities or safe spaces or whatever it might be. And so, again, particularly though from the data sets, you see girls, socioeconomic status, ethnic or racial minorities or immigrant youth, youth with disabilities, overweight, obese youth. These are some of the populations that are overrepresented in these statistics when you look at it. So, for example, Going back to Hennepin County, this is again back to this 2006 briefing that I just mentioned. Um, the, the bars on the left just basically show you the same gender disparity that we've talked about. But if you just look at the right for the moment, that's a map of Hennepin County geographic areas. The lighter the color, the less active the youth in that area. So as you can see in North Minneapolis, for example, the kids are less active compared to their neighboring regions or sections. And then you can just see it. So the darker colors are more active uh, compared to the lighter colors. So another example is that it seems there's something with geography or, or urban location or location that uh, also is related to being somewhat underserved, probably for lots of the reasons I already mentioned. So again, we do have kids that we can do better with. Well, in terms of providing a basic philosophy, I'm giving you a snapshot of that already, but let me refine a few points for you that Mo and Nicole and I would agree to. I think that, as we've talked over the last year or two here, that we really see physical activity. The one thing I noticed when I started looking at the youth development literature is that did a terrific job and had a lot of relevance for me as a physical activity person when I looked at the psychological assets and the social assets and the intellectual assets that are very well spelled out in the youth development frameworks and literature. But what I wasn't seeing, I would see it at minimum, there might be a physical health kind of item on the list, but what I really didn't see fleshed out in that same way were the physical assets, as I would call them, which to me are every bit as important and every bit as much life skills or assets as are other types of psychological and social assets that we want for our youth. 
So again, we'll, hopefully you'll have some good discussion about this, but in my mind, what I'd like to do is have us reframe our thinking to add and flesh out and spend as much time and thought developing the life skills, the physical life skills that children and youth need, just as we do with, again, other types of life skills, depending on whatever, what framework you're using to guide your programs. So think about physical skills as life skills. And so I come up with something that looks uh, like this, which we have an example of in the Tucker Center report, which Nicole will be talking more about. But I just added a bubble. I took, I took some of the existing assets from the psychological and social side. I took, just kind of made a cumulative list of assets derived from a number of the other positive youth development frameworks. And I, I tailored them a little bit to physical activity. But I'm mostly going to talk about that left one. Just, just point out to you, if I could leave you with nothing else today, the one thing I'd hope you'd walk away with is thinking more about that physical category as assets, as an important category of assets that needs to be spelled out. And so I've just listed some examples. It's not highly refined at this point, but some things that I think I want healthy youth to have. I want them to be physically healthy. I want them to have fitness in those various components that we talked about. I want them to have the physiological capacity to do what they need to do in life and to be in the activities that they want to be in. I want them to have physical skills so that they feel conf competent and confident and successful in social situations and in business situations and in others that typically involve physical activity. I want them to just have a physically active lifestyle, not something they have to give a second thought to, but something that's so much a part of who they are that they won't have to think about it. It just is. They just are active. They're living active, physically active lives. And so these are just some examples of physical assets that, again, I hope that you will think about in terms of how they fit with your current work. Now, my colleagues will be talking more about this. Uh, Nicole, particularly, is going to be talking about some practical ways of implementing what we know from ev the evidence that we've read for the Tucker Report and using that information to develop best practices. So this just gives you a snapshot of some of the major things that I think about in terms of what we should be doing as physical activity leaders or as people who have physical activity in our programs. We establish mastery climates. We think carefully about the climate that we offer. We provide context with a variety of programming to meet these different needs and interests of these different groups. We use a variety of methods, teaching methods, active learning, fun situations. We have social support opportunities. You mix up pairs and teams so that kids get to work with different kids and meet new friends. And we have tangible sorts of support, facilities that are safe and welcoming and so on. Again, these are just some examples of physical activity related features that I think are very important in your programs. Um, now, I feel like I'm switching gears just a little bit, but let me give you an example. We're here also to talk about our Tucker Center report, and Mo um, Nicole's going to talk more about that and tell you about the newsletters, I think, and such things that are on your table. But I wrote uh, part of the report uh, along with Nicole. And so just a big picture for you is that you'll see several chapters in this report. And I'm going to be talking about the psychological considerations. So what I'm doing now is giving you an example in terms of what I read. My job in this report was to read what the sports psychology literature had to say, or the psychology literature had to say, about how evidence-based information from this scholarship could be used to better our practices, again, from a psychological standpoint in particular. So I'm going to be talking about some examples of things that I report on in Chapter 2 of this Tucker Center report, again, as an example of how we can use research to inform our practice in this area. And my brief working definition for you today is to... to when I think about psychological dimensions, we were writing for girls, although most of what I wrote about applies to boys as well. Uh, so in this case, girls' actions, thoughts, and feelings related to physical activity contexts is what I think about when I think about sports psychology. Secondly, I think about reciprocal influence, so what girls bring to a context in terms of their psychology and how that affects what they do once they get there. And in turn, once they get there, how the climate and other interactions and, and settings affect their psychology. So there's a reciprocal influence going on there. 
And so again, just to give you some examples of findings, I'm just highlighting things that are in the report, and so you can find the details and the reference citations and so on in the actual report. So remember I was talking about thoughts, feelings, and actions as part of my definition. First of all, what are some of the things that girls think about physical activity? Well, and this is true for boys as well, this is not girl specific, youth participate in sport. Um, we have this pretty well spelled out in large part thanks to Dr. Weiss's research over the years with many of her students and, and certainly many other scholars as well. But youth participate for three major categories of reasons, to demonstrate physical competence or adequacy, to gain social acceptance or be part of a group, and for enjoyment. And they stop participating for the converse reasons. And it's pretty straightforward. If it's not fun or enjoyable, if they don't feel accepted, if they're not getting better or demonstrating competence, those are the kids that are more likely to drop out. So it has simple implications and lessons for us as practitioners. And then being harmed in some way comes into the equation too as to why kids might leave. In terms of other competence perceptions, First of all, there's an age-related trend. Younger children, as you might know, as you work with young children, are overly optimistic and feel like they can do anything. And then as kids get older, they become more realistic about that. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but I suppose that we all have to grow up at some point and, and learn that we can't do everything, but we can try. And secondly, from a gender perspective, however, girls do, from the earliest of ages that there was data on, perceive themselves as less physically competent than boys. So again, if you're working particularly with girls, you, you have to consider that in terms of the pra the, your practices. Um, secondly, what are some examples of things that girls feel about physical activity? How do girls feel in terms of their affect? Again, we talked about why kids play, and this is true for boys as well for both boys and girls and across the age range up through high school age, the ages that we're talking about, fun and enjoyment are the predominant reason that kids give for participating in sport and physical activity. And so again, it's just, I don't know how many times we adults have to get hit over the head with that before we actually take that to heart. Now fun doesn't mean you're goofing around all the time. It means that you set up a situation though where kids can succeed, where they're optimally challenged, where they experience mastery and connection and and meet those motives that we just talked about earlier. And so if you make a context fun and enjoyable, which again doesn't always just mean, especially if you're in an organized sport program, it can be fun and enjoyable and you're gonna work hard. I just, I've, some of you that heard the Tucker talk heard me mention I, had, I coach eighth grade girls volleyball right now. I had practice last night and we had captain's practice. Girls loved it. I had told them in the previous practice that they had three assignments, so they had homework for practice and they had to come in and they led the practice. So I had eight girls, each girl was assigned to come in with a drill. She was the coach for that drill. She had to set them up, figure out how to split up into teams. That was fun, they had a ball. But we got a lot done. They, as a matter of fact, they worked each, <laughs> worked each other harder than I normally do. So again, it doesn't mean you have to trade one thing for another, you can have it all. Uh, I think that's a good thing. In terms of the counter side of the affect or emotional feeling kind of equation. There are certainly many aspects of sport in particular that's been looked at, but I think many of these are true for general physical activity settings as well. Sport and physical activity certainly can be very stressful for kids, not just girls, but girls certainly. There are personal factors and situational factors. Some of those are listed there that affect their what's called state anxiety, how anxious they are in a particular situation. And I know a lot of girls are very intimidated by physical activity settings. Again, if you start thinking about overweight youth, obese youth, underactive youth, youth that aren't very skilled. You know, a lot of kids are still growing into their bodies. I'm not telling you stuff that you don't know, but what you have to think about is how that affects their willingness to participate in various physical activities that you have to offer. And then for more organized sport participants, when you, some of you might be working in those contexts, certainly burnout comes into play too from an, a, an extreme example of emotional burnout, if you will, or exhaustion. And so certainly there are negative sides to physical activity. And again, I mention that because it, we can do something about it. The more I know about what kids like and don't like and what's building for them and what's stressful for them, I can select practices and recommend practices that um, build on the strengths and lessen the negative affect. Also in just terms of other brief examples of cognitive and emotional factors that kind of intertwine. So in terms of mental health, to me there's a consistent body of literature that suggests that just general overall mental health is improved by 
at least a modestly or moderately physically active lifestyle. Secondly, for those of you that might be in clinical settings, you I'm sure know this also, but for the rest of us, as an adjunct to other forms of treatment, more cognitive or um, therapeutic kinds of interventions, in addition to that, to have activity is very helpful for many particularly uh, many patients, particularly in terms of depression and anxiety. And third, for those of you that work in school situations, the cognitive functioning, I think that literature is really exciting. It's you know, on the cutting edge now, but I think physical educators and others have known that for years, that if you keep kids active, give them breaks during the day, they're more on task in the classroom, their cognitive functioning is better, and you actually don't, even by, quote, losing a little bit of academic time, the gains, it more than pays back this is my read on it, more than pays back in terms of the, the benefits that accrue. So that was, those were some examples of cognitions and affect. Let me give you some examples from the social climate in terms of how things affect girls. Um, parents, I am a sport parent, a physic, uh, trying to raise physically active kids of my own. I have two middle school agers, so I have sat on many a sideline, and I've seen the good and the bad. Um, along with that, and I've tried to do what I can do to you know, emphasize the good there. In terms of fathers, if we have some fathers out there, I'm assuming we do, you are very salient to your daughters and sons, but again, I was writing about daughters in this case. You're very influential in terms of their sport competence and value beliefs, so I would, I would charge you to take that responsibility very seriously and do what you can to build up and encourage and support your daughter without pressuring and pushing your daughter. One of our scholars, Dan Gould, in, in sports psychology has written about optimal push, for example. There's an optimal amount. You need, we're, those of us that are parents, there's a little bit of pushing you need to do in all fronts. But you have to figure out where you know, enough is enough and you don't push too hard. And so the types of influence that fathers um, hold, for example, uh, have consequences for their daughter. So in the soccer study, for example, girls were more satisfied with their participation when they felt like their fathers were involved, but placing low amounts of pressure. And then fathers more typically take the direct and active role in their daughter's participation. And, and again, we want you to keep doing that, dads, but we want you mothers to also get more active because girls need that as well. So mothers, you're often the ones to sign the child up, to search out the program, sign the daughter or son up for the programs. You're the ones to do the logistic support most often, getting the shoes, planning dinners, making sure the uniform's clean, all of that support sort of work. But girls, in studies that I looked at, desperately want female role models. So those are great logistical things, but my dream world, both the mothers and the fathers would share both the logistical and active roles with their kids. And I just really think everyone benefits by that model. Uh, in terms of leader climates, there are some things that we know. I'm, I'm laughing because I was, I'm supposed to do my, all right, you guys, you've been sitting out here looking at me so long, and I cannot believe you're not paying better attention. Get out of here if you're not going to pay attention today. And it, you're looking at me seriously, you guys. And so you're going to the mean coach voice. Well, you know that that's not a good thing for kids, but how many times have you heard that on the sideline? of a practice, or have you heard that in an organized physical activity setting? <laughs> Kids are ridiculed and embarrassed and intimidated in that situation. That's not the way to encourage their activity. And so these more ego-oriented leaders, if you are one, work on yourself. I have to too, sometimes I slip into mean coach mode. You have to work on yourself, and there's a time and a place. You save it in your pocket is the way I think about it for when you really need it, and use it sparingly and minimally. There's a time when you need to light the fire a little bit. But clearly these sort of punitive, negative kinds of environments are related to undesirable consequences for both boys and girls in terms of anxiety, redu reduced enjoyment, and so on. So what we would like you to do, whether it's a coaching situation or any sort of physical activity situation, is to use a more task-involving climate where you focus on improvement, effort, support, value, and valuing the role of all your athletes, or all your participants, I should say. And again, the literature clearly shows us that this kind of leader climate is much more tied to positive outcomes, enjoyment, satisfaction, motivation, and so on. So again, the evidence tells us that that is what kids benefit from. So use that style of leadership in your physical activity settings, again, whether they're organized sport or not. And in terms of peers, anything you can do, we talked about social support. The more you can do with peers to advantage each other's participation, the better. So in terms of the sport friendships that girls have, for example, 
again, there's clear evidence that having friendships in sport is tied to all kinds of positive outcomes, positive psychological outcomes for girls. There are many dimensions to sport friendships, and girls in particular, in particularly Dr. Weiss's work, have spoken about the importance of emotional connection in the context of sport friendships. Although, again, as I've talked with Mo about it, I, I really feel like boys want that too. They maybe just don't admit it, or they, they, it looks a little bit different. You know, that, but it, I still think that boys really want relationships and value connection. And I have a son and a daughter, so I kind of watch both of them. And I really, at the end of the day, feel like boys and girls are not that different. Just a few minor different. I really do. I think they're a lot more alike than they are different in terms of what they want from physical activity, what they want from leaders, what kinds of friendships they value, and so on. And so in terms of peers, again, the evidence clearly shows me that young people being around supportive peers are more active. So getting with a group or being the impetus, you might be the young person in the group that gets the rest of your kids active. Watching each other, my daughter loves to have her friends come watch her play volleyball. The kids that are on the volleyball team loves to come watch her play. That's very supportive and encouraging and recognizing each other's accomplishments. So again, anything you can do to facilitate that among peers is um, very helpful. Okay, well, let me uh, conclude. I have three or four brief examples of things I want to talk about in terms of action, and then certainly when Nicole speaks, she'll be telling you a lot more about action strategies. And this may not seem like action, but it's an action that we all need to take. So I, I hope you've gotten the feel by now that I think there's some philosophical shift that we need to make in terms of how we work with young people in physical activity situations. So in a sport context, again, I'm coming back to the word sport, which, again, we love sport, but that's only one piece of physical activity. But if we focused on sport, I don't know if you like my term, but I think about it as sport as more the fun, the joy, the participation, choices, motivating, rather than sports per se. Now, there's a time and a place. I like organized sports. My kids play them. That's fine. They fill a certain function. But for broad-based participation, that's only one small piece of it. So the more we can stay on that right-hand side for the vast majority of kids, I think the better off. So one action strategy is for you to possibly reframe your thinking a little bit, hopefully with a couple of things I've talked about. And related to that is this. I'm, semantics always come to me a little bit. But um, I, I think about, and both of these are good. Neither of these are bad. Some kids are motivated by workouts and structures and training and training logs. I have to confess, I've never been one of them. Been in sports really my whole life, certainly as a young person, organized, intercollegiate, all that. But I was there because I loved it. I was on the green side. Creative, spontaneity, free play. I just loved to play, even if it was organized, structured, competitive sport. I was there because I loved to play. But the point is, different kids respond to different things. I think a lot of kids, though particularly those that aren't in organized sports, are going to be on that green side. So the more you can think about intrinsic motivation and enjoyment, the better off I think you're going to be for the majority of kids. Now again, you'll have a subset of kids, depending on where you work, that will really thrive on those um, very uh, structured kinds of goal-setting, achievement-oriented physical activity settings. So both would be great, but again, it depends on what type of program you've got. Um, you can't see this very well, and I guess you don't need to. Most of you have probably seen it at some point, but let me give you an example of an activity that I do in class. I teach a class on competitive sport for children and youth for mostly kinesiology majors, but I get students from other majors coming as well, and I'm hoping for more of that as time goes on. But one of the activities we do is I bring in a sheet of the assets. For example, this happens to be the Search Institute asset, 40 developmental assets for middle childhood. But it could be from any, any of the positive youth development frameworks. And then I assign kids, pairs or individuals, a number. One of the 40 had almost 40 this time, so they each took one. And they had to come up with two or three specific strategies that could be used to build that asset in a physical activity context. And it's easy to do. They don't have any trouble coming up with things that we do in physical activity that help build those assets. So again, you might do this for yourself. I've been talking about mostly building physical assets, but clearly, as my, I stayed away from this because both of my colleagues are going to talk about building psychological and social assets also, in addition to through physical activity. And this list is more based in, the, in that area, and we still can use physical activity to build all of these other assets. So that's an activity you might challenge yourself to say, take one of these lists and list some things that you could do, specific activities in physical activity to build that asset. 
Um, now, my last activity is actually an activity. I've been counting heads as you're coming in here. I'm not good at multitasking, but um, it was last week was National Physical Education and Sport Week, as promoted by our national organization for physical education, the American Alliance of Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. I don't know if we have any physical or health educators here today. So it was, I'm a little bit late, just a few days late, but it was National Physical Education and Sport Week. And so what I'm going to spend about five or ten minutes doing is I have two things. Um, would you guys grab those bags for me? And just walk out to any table and give a bag to a table. If you're at a table that either Mo or Nicole gives you a bag with, you have, we'll aim for about seven or eight minutes to take your bag, any open space. My point is, what can you do in the space that you have? What can you do with people who aren't dressed for physical activity? Can you come up? I'm a games person. So your job, take your table and find any open space where you won't hurt anybody. And go ahead and develop a game with anything or everything in the bag. You have eight minutes and you all can go get started. So take your bag and just find a space around the perimeter. Everyone else, we're going to do a... Um, forgive my Australian accent, a walkabout speed meeting. And your task is to stand up. You can walk anywhere. Don't pop anyone else's bubble. Have you heard that from elementary physical education? Don't invade their personal space or pop their bubble. But when you are walking about anywhere in the space, I want you to walk with one other person who has the same color shoes on that you have. And then every time you hear the whistle, you have to find a new partner you leave that partner after your speed meeting walkabout. You leave them after a minute, find a new partner with the, the same color shoes. Everyone clear? Okay, so leave your stuff. You're up walking about. Your minute is starting. <laughs> new partner? Keep walking, keep walking. <laughs> okay, now you have a new assignment, walkers. The game builder's time is up. You can walk to anyone's game station and have, once you get a crowd there, games people, show them your game, play their game. We've got about two minutes. You'll only get to see one game, probably, walkers, and then we'll head back to the seat. So go to anybody's game, any of the four, and watch how they, watch their creativity and imagination.